Hi, my name is Jay Sugarman, and I want to welcome you to Museum Open House. This ongoing series features and highlights many of the outstanding museums and other cultural institutions. The main purpose of most programs is to inform viewers about current and upcoming exhibits, various programs, resources, and other opportunities that are available for the general public. Today, we're fortunate to have as our guests Nancy Netzer and Diana Larson from the McMullen Museum of Art at Boston College. Nancy is the director of the museum and is also a professor of art history. Diana is assistant director at the museum and together with UMass professor Victoria Weston curated the outstanding spring exhibition entitled Eagle Mania, Collecting Japanese Art in Gilded Age America. During the program, we're finding out why and how the exhibition came about. We'll go on a behind-the-scenes tour of the wide range of items on display and subjects covered, and in the process, come to better understand and appreciate the fascinating restoration process and research surrounding a magnificent 340-pound bronze sculpture of an eagle that was donated to Boston College by the Lars Anderson estate in the mid-1950s. Let's start by meeting our guest and then finding out all about Eagle Mania. Welcome, so delighted you're both able to be here today. You know, as always, had a fabulous visit, eager to go back to learn more, to hear you share more, and as we'll find out, it's much more than just an exhibition that the story around, as I hinted, the restoration process is well worth hearing about just in its own right. Um, Nancy, could we please start maybe before we jump to the uh, exhibition, just reminding people about uh, the McMullen Museum, overall mission and what it has to offer the general public. Well, the McMullen Museum, about three years ago, moved into what was originally the old Cardinal's residence um, at 2101 Commonwealth Avenue. And we have renovated the original building, which was built in 1927 as a palazzo, mm. and added on to have better facilities for welcoming our visitors. The McMullen Museum is open seven days a week. Um, it's free of charge. Yeah. And um, every Sunday, we offer free docent tours of our exhibitions at 2 o'clock. So we hope many of your viewers will take advantage of those wonderful tours. Um, we also have a full menu of free programming <coughs> that we undertake during the semester at Boston College mm. and to which we invite the public. So we ask your audience to go online and look at the programs that we offer and um, extend a warm welcome to them. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to sort of continue our tour of the campus and we'll soon find out the relationship to the exhibition. Could you share what we're seeing here, please? Yes. <laughs> this is the central building of Boston College. Um, it was the first building completed on the Chestnut Hill campus, mm -hmm. and I think it's about 1914. Um, it was the, the central administration building at that point, and still to some extent is, um, although the school has grown exponentially since it opened the Chestnut Hill campus. But in front of that building is the icon of the university, and that is the Bronze Eagle. Yeah. Um, in 1955 or 1956, a Bronze Eagle was placed on top of this column. And in 1993, that Bronze Eagle uh, was taken down because it was in disrepair from having been exposed to the elements for such a long time. And several years later, it was replaced. Um, and that was all that we knew for mm -hmm. a long time. Yeah. Um, until 2014, when Russ Gant, who was teaching at Showa Women's University and was taking Japanese students around 
Boston to look at Japanese works of art, um, called the university to alert us to the fact that he thought our eagle was a Japanese masterpiece. Yes. <laughs> the university at that point told him that what he was looking at was a replica and that the original had been taken down in 1993. Um, and Russ followed up yeah. with the maker of the replica who told him that he hadn't thrown away the original. And so uh, Bob Schur at Skylight Studios in Woburn mm -hmm. pulled out the original eagle in pieces. And at that point, um, he contacted Diana Larson. Diana went with him to look at the eagle. And it was absolutely clear that it was indeed a masterpiece. Wow. And Diana then organized um, a number of conservators and experts in Japanese art, including Victoria Weston, <laughs> to look at the eagle, to have them assess it as well. And um, everyone was in agreement that this was worth restoring. Most definitely. And that there was a possibility that it could have been done in the most famous of the Japanese workshops of the late 19th century that was run by Chokichi. So, so let okay. Diana take it from there. Yeah, and how did that transition to the notion between you and Victoria of coming up with this exhibition? Well, actually, when I first went to Skylight Studios uh, with the conservators, uh, recognizing the quality of this object, I thought of it really would be an amazing thing to be the centerpiece of an exhibition mm -hmm. because there were so many fascinating stories that um, resulted. I mean, particularly the, the Provenance story of the Lars Anderson, yes. and that was already a story. But then thinking about the context, contextualizing the depiction of an eagle at this particular period in Japan, it, it, an exhibition was just almost a, a must, a must be. So Victoria then um, jumped on board very enthusiastically and we went from there. Well, as we sort of step inside, for those who haven't had the opportunity yet to visit, would you just give us a very brief overview of how things are laid out and maybe some of the major themes or areas that you're getting across? Certainly. Um, we began actually thinking that we would like the eagle to be placed in a central location in, in the museum and have the different themes uh, spoke out like, like it would be the hub of a wheel of themes. Yes. Uh, our space wouldn't quite uh, mm. accommodate that, so the eagle is now the, the axial point of the exhibition, so that's where you end up. But in order to begin, yeah. uh, when you walk in, we, we started to, to look at raptors in Japanese art, and we started with the Edo period. So we have a hawk, an eagle section and a hawk section. And then as you move through the space, we also in, were introducing the depiction of hawks uh, in samurai culture as well as commoner culture. And then as you move further through, we have a, an area dedicated to the Lars and Isabel Andersons who collected the eagle, as you see there. And um, we have another section on the other side that actually deals with the subject of world's fairs. Mm. And the world's fairs yeah. were places where Westerners would go and see the splendors of Japan displayed and could purchase things there. And then our final gallery are the great eagles. And uh, we had hoped, anyway, we have, we have three pretty great eagles plus some wonderful most paintings Most definitely, there. most definitely. Yes. Well, we're gonna sort of trace our steps back and look at a few select items as we go through a rather spirited tour. So going back to the beginning that uh, visitors will find, what are we seeing? Well, please? this is in the first section, the eagle section. And this, these are the earliest pieces in the show. These, these date from the late 17th century, and they're Arita porcelain. Uh, Japan came late to making porcelain, um, and it wasn't until hmm. the Chinese porcelain kilns closed in 1644, the, the Ming Dynasty kilns. Japan was, uh, a, a Korean potter brought the technology to Japan, okay. and Arita was the dominant uh, factory for a long time, and they're characterized by beautiful color, and um, these would have been the kind of thing that would have been made for export, and Holland being the first trade partner um, in that era. 
they probably were, were yeah, European I mean, imports. It's such a treat to see these items throughout, just so up close and to appreciate the craftsmanship. These are particularly splendid and the feat of, of rendering uh, something at this scale in porcelain is very difficult. Mm. So it's, it's a technological feat as well. Uh, so to anchor our, to anchor our our display. This is actually a hawk. So the other screen, this is a pair of screens from the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. So on the eagle side you have the eagle. Um, the, the painter is Soga uh, Nichokwan uh -huh. and um, these are also late, early eight, late 17th century, early 18th. And the eagle was not um, that well known to these artists because eagles there's only one eagle indigenous to Japan that doesn't, uh, it lives in very remote areas. So these, hmm. e the, the depiction of eagles would have been familiar to this particular painter through Chinese art. Interesting. And so the actual style is, is, is a, a sort of a Chinese style using bold brushwork. Mm -hmm. And the choice of having a hawk and an eagle are these dominant predators that really dominate their territory which are characteristics of a samurai warrior because this painter would have painted for the elite warrior warriors, the samurai. And so th these were kind of embodiments of what it meant to be a samurai. Mm -hmm. And here the eagle is grandly situated in a very remote landscape with a waterfall and craggy rocks. Nice. The and other screen, which is on the hawk side of the gallery, this is to confuse everybody, um, it's a kumataka, but it's actually known as a hawk eagle. <laughs> so, but it is a type of hawk, and he is identified by a crest on his, on his head. You can see the feathers rise up. Mm -hmm. This hawk is actually sitting in a pine tree, which is imagery that was often associated with hawks. The pine tree um, kind of connotes winter because haw hawking, which was a samurai sport, yeah, yeah. was a winter sport. So the pine tree is often depicted with the hawk. And again, this, this bird is in his element there uh, on this, on this uh, Chinese-style painted uh, tree that has gnarly roots, which is very characteristic of that now type of Now, there's so painting. much to see. And we're going to move on just with a quick reference of this hawk, please. This is another hawk, and this is actually superb. This is a Meiji period hawk, as opposed to these other pieces that were Edo period. And this is very uh, typical uh, for the Western market. This is, in fact, an incense burner. It's, it's rendered in silver on a real wood, gnarly wood base. And the Meiji period is characterized by a real attention to naturalism. And this hawk looks like he just landed there. Mm -hmm. um, another interesting thing to mention about him is the use of silver, which uh, was probably the closest that a metal artist could get to the rendering of white plumage. And white plumage was um, auspicious. And so you'll see throughout our exhibition the odd white hawk. And, yes, uh, yes. And the other thing, uh, what was I going to say? Yes, the artist here was a prize winner. His name was Katsuyoshi. And he was, in fact, an armorer. So he, he made arms and armor for samurai. And when that uh, feudal system uh, ended in 1868, he had to turn his skills to making things for the Western market and making beautiful metal objects. Nice. So this is one of his masterpieces. We're going to pick up our pace as we go through, and here we're going to see a couple of uh, wonderful depictions, and you mentioned samurai. Yes, this is in the samurai section, and this is another wonderful album from the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which has many, many pages, of which we only have two. The previous page was is on display, and then we have the auspicious white yeah. hawk. These are visible on an iPad right next to the book, because we can only open one page. It is an album of calligraphy and hawks uh, to instruct a young samurai in the sport of hawking. And it, the texts are actually beautiful on colored paper. And they are Confucian texts that are very, uh, mm. have to do with duty and sort of the, the, the lessons of, of learning hawking. And the hawks themselves are very realistically uh, observed. The Kano school of painters who, mm -hmm. were, who were affiliated with the samurai mm. elite um, were, were observed their, their renderings from real birds, nice. real, real 
birds. And then these wonderful, we'll take mm -hmm. a quick look at these two screens that we're going to see. Well, these were the, really the, the, the centerpiece of our show, of, our, of this particular uh, gallery. When we saw these screens, we mm. thought these have to be, these are very unusual from a private collector. We have two screens. One here depicts a hawking estate. So these hawks were gathered when, some of them when they were just chicks, to be trained for the sport, ah, of, sport of okay. hawking or yes. falconry. And so this is an estate and there's a, there's a nest that's been man-made with the little chicks in it, a water bowl, and the uh, oak and bamboo, which uh, reflect resilience and strength, which are characteristics mm. of the samurai. Um, on the other screen, we have a very f fanciful uh, depiction of a spring garden. Yes, there are three exquisite. types of, of plants, the azalea for one, and the cherry blossoms. And then we have a whole array on the left of exotic birds, and uh, they're quite wonderful. And then on the right is a family of chickens that are extremely whimsical. And uh, I encourage viewing that up close. Oh yes, there's so much you can see there. And going to look at some other screens to get a sense of what's on display. Very different screens. Yes. These are these are all in the opposite gallery and having to do with commoner culture. And uh, how do you tell that this is perhaps a commoner depiction? The birds themselves are very graphic, and the, and they are in, rendered in black and white, and they aren't very naturalistic if you compare them to the album of Hawking. And there are two white birds that sort of fl flank the, the array, mm -hmm. so it, it's very graphic and very decorative, and a lot of attention has been paid to the fabric of their perches, which lends Victoria's theory, this is her theory, um, lends to the thought that these may have been belonged to a merchant in textiles. Mm. So someone in the commoner culture, but at the top end of that, uh -huh. so, which differs from what a samurai would have collected. And these screens were actually room dividers. So well, staying with the commoner <laughs> area, we have <laughs> just oh, some fa go. just a few of so many fabulous items that if you could just say a quick word. Very quick. This is a netsuke, which is a little toggle, which would have been worn on a, a, an inrow, which was a little a box that a man would have worn on his on his waistband. Um, this is just a beautiful thing, a little tiny object, yeah. a hawk sitting on eggplant, which is one of the <laughs> auspicious three New Year's dreams. Mm. Mount Fuji is one. Yeah. Uh, resplendence. The hawk is one which is uh, plenty or wealth, and the eggplant is fecundity. Wow. Three auspicious dreams of the new year. Oh, and this is an exquisite inro, which is actually that kind of little, what, what we might call a man purse. And this has actually been extended so you can see the interior. It's actually a hawk, a white hawk on a pine tree. And then inside you can notice there are articulated feathers. It's the most oh, exquisite yeah. thing. Uh, to look at close up. You have to get close. And this take of it. That's when it's been closed up, so now you can actually identify the hawk on the, on the pine branch. And you can see the natsuke, which is the little uh, toggle at the top. So you see the whole thing in its completion of how it would be. We mentioned at the beginning Lars Anderson and the incredible impact that his presence, his family, and the donation had to the Eagle Mania. Absolutely. This was a f really fascinating story. And so we got um, two portraits. We, we wanted to include the Auto Museum, which is actually in Brookline yes. and was their summer home. The estate, unfortunately, was torn down, but the carriage house remains. And they, the Auto Museum uh, lent us this bronze oh, bust wonderful. of Lars yeah. by <laughs> Bruce Saville, a, a local artist. And it is a bronze of him at age 50 after he had been an ambassador to Japan. So it's 1916, and he's wearing his medal of the Society of the Cincinnati, which is his, his family belonged to this patriotic organization. Mm. And in fact, their home in Washington is owned by the Society of the Cincinnati. It was left. They had a beautiful home in near DuPont Circle, and uh, Isabel had donated that home to the Society of the Cincinnati. So our portrait of her, which is next, uh, comes from that 
a wonderful collection and pu the public can visit that collection. This is a portrait of Isabel, much younger. She's at age 24, mm. uh, circa 1900, 1901, just back from their honeymoon journey in Japan when they bought our eagle, by the way. Um, and this is by Cecilia Bow. She's a well-known uh, portrait artist of that time. And she depicts uh, Isabel as a hostess in a beautiful dress in her home in Brookline, actually at the estate at Weld, and depicts many of the Japanese objects that they would have brought back from their honeymoon journey, including the crystal ball on the table there, of which we actually have the... I know, that's one of their most prized in, yes. in reading their comments and thoughts about it. This was one of the most expensive items. Um, one exciting thing happened when we were down researching at this estate in Washington, at the Society of the Cincinnati. We came across the packing inventory for the La Lars Anderson's honeymoon journey, 1897, <laughs> wow. on which our eagle was listed. So we knew for a fact that they bought it on their honeymoon. But the crystal ball costs more than our eagle. Mm. Mm. Amazing. Another wonderful item in their and collection. Another very high value item. Um, uh, Gilded Age collectors really loved lacquer because it's such a, a wonderfully, typically Japanese technique, uh, very painstaking. And this, these are lacquer writing boxes, the smaller one being for inks and, uh, and so forth, and the, other, the larger one for paper. You mentioned the World's Fair influence. Yes, um, this is a typical object for a World's Fair display. Uh, this is a small cabinet, or kodansu, and it is in the Yokohama lacquer, which is characterized by a, a gold ground and then a use of different material inlays, such as uh, metal alloys and horn and mother of pearl and ivory, and all these birds are in relief on here. Mm. What makes it typical of a uh, World's Fair piece, or for the Western market, is the fact that um, a Japanese collector would, would say, why are you depicting hawks with cherry blossoms? Because cherry blossoms are actually a spring mm -hmm. image, and the hawks are usually associated with pine. So this was just a decorative, fanciful piece for the Western market, mm -hmm. possibly shown at the World's Fair. And this wonderful item. Uh, this is a, ra uh, a model of a pagoda. It stands about, about that high. and. Um, in fact, there's an image of a pagoda at the entry to the Chicago World's Fair of 1893, very similar mm. to this one. This one has five stories, which is typical of a Japanese pagoda, and the, the top, the mast at the top, it's a, it's a symbol of moving toward enlightenment. And this, this piece had two tiny little Shyakyamuna um, figures, Buddhist figures, which we didn't have for our show, but we, we have the piece there. And this is also a piece by Katsuyoshi who did the eagle incense burner, I'm mm. sorry, the hawk incense burner at the beginning. Another wonderful samurai artist working in metal creating a gourd shape, um, which is a former water bottle in the, in the earlier period, uh -huh. on a nest of silver leaves with a whimsical tree frog climbing up the yes. side. And the use of different metals is very typical of this sophisticated work uh, in Japan at the time, metal workers. And these are so wonderful together. These are a, a very exquisite pair of cloisonne uh, vases. So this cloisonne technique was very typical of Chinese work. It came late again to, ch to Japan, but Japan did something very different with cloisonne, and they were working almost in a painterly way with these enamels, uh, using color to depict a real changing season with these, l these fall leaves, and they are quite exquisite. And moving on in the time we have left to get to some of the great eagles. Yes, well we were very fortunate to get this eagle from the Metropolitan Museum of Art on a stump. It is an eagle that has, is very closely attributed to the artist that Nancy mentioned, Chokichi mm -hmm. Suzuki, and uh, pretty sure that it, it's by him. It's actually rendered in iron, which is a little bit different from the bronze casting because the feathers would have been inserted individually into a core, mm. making, making the feathers more articulated because it's iron. Uh -huh. And the petrified stump is almost six feet tall. It's a very prominent and realistic stump. It's gorgeous. Um, yes. And, and there, and the and there we are. This is the showpiece, uh -huh. the absolute showpiece. So um, we have a unique opportunity here to see this bird at eye level because, mm -hmm. as you saw at the beginning, it, it's been sitting on a column, the, the replica, 
and now we can actually stare right into its eyes. It is an exquisite ah, piece yeah. of bronze casting. And this monumental bronze casting was very difficult. So it's, it's very likely that a, a studio such as Chokichi's would have been able to do this. Very few other studios would have been able to produce such a large piece. I'll just mention and call people's attention to both the exhibition but also the website mm -hmm. where you can see this terrific uh, video mm -hmm. that takes uh, viewers through the restoration process, the rediscovery yep, yep. that you can go before you visit uh, the exhibition in person. And you mentioned uh, mm -hmm the white figures. The, yes, well this is a very unusual Meiji period eagle uh, rendered in ivory and ivory was a material usually reserved for the tiny netsukes and small things. So the technique of working in ivory um, was adapted here because each feather was done separately and inserted into a wooden core. So if you look at this eagle close up it really looks like a live bird with, with every feather articulated. <laughs> it's exquisite. And wrapping up our tour, we're going to look at a couple of these images. We have these wonderful scroll paintings from the Metropolitan Museum. Very fortunate to get these. Only three out of a uh, possible four because we couldn't fit more than more than three. Um, these were by the very famous Kawanabe Kyosai, who's an unusual painter of rather outlandish subjects. And here he depicts these eagles uh, attacking their prey, or at least the eagles and their prey. And the prey are often rabbits or raccoon dogs or, um, yeah, I think the, the, those are two that I'm remembering, mm -hmm. but um, they are usually endowed with humanistic uh, characteristics, so their eyes are always looking at you a little bit. Uh, well, pathetically. <laughs> <laughs> the so. exhibition's on display until June 2nd, so plenty of time for viewers and general public to make their way there a number of times to really appreciate fascinating story of the restoration projects as well as the items that you've assembled is really well worth time getting over to the McMullen. And Nancy, I know in addition to this fabulous exhibition, you have lots more going on. We do. Um, upstairs in the Monin Gallery, we have a display of prints from the artists uh, who were associated with the Spanish city of Cuenca. And this is an old medieval city that was purchased by Fernando Zobel in the early 1960s. Uh, in order to give artists in Spain the opportunity to work in abstraction and to show their mm. works far from the watchful eye of the Franco regime. Mm. Uh, so it's a wonderful political story and it's a story of artists who were working in abstraction um, many of whom are not known to us, largely because of political circumstances. No, it's gorgeous, gorgeous. Wonderful. It's a wonderful, it's the first uh, exhibition of the Cuenca artists all together in America. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, unfortunately we have to wrap up. I want to thank you both for being here. Uh, just okay. fascinating to learn more and more. And I think we should note f terrific catalog that accompanies the exhibition. Edited by Victoria Weston, yes. To get yeah. some wonderful background information on what you can enjoy seeing there. So thank you so much, congratulations, and look forward to making my way back there at least another time. Wonderful. Thank you thank for having you. us again, Jay. I yes. also want to thank those of you watching for joining us and hope you'll be able to tune in next time.